Terror in Brussels. Bombers attack the airport. Dozens are killed, hundreds wounded. From the explosion to when you come to your senses again, those two, three seconds is, is unreal. You hear screams, that's an arm, that's a leg. You can see that. I mean, the this, this smell, that was disgusting. As 38-year-old Sebastian Bellin lay gravely injured, these images of him were already circulating on the internet, becoming symbols of the Brussels airport terrorist attack. You feel death creeping on you. From knee down, you don't feel anything anymore. And then it goes up to your thighs. And you're thinking, OK, this is going up. But if it hits my heart, I'm done. 4,000 miles away, at Bellin's home in Battle Creek, Michigan, his wife, Sarah, had just woken up when she received a text from a friend. We're thinking of you. We're here for you, Sarah. We love you. And I thought, that's a strange message. But then I saw the photo. I screamed. I woke the girls up from my screaming. It was panic and terror. And I saw that he was trying to look up. Bellin had lost 50% of his blood and was rushed to the hospital and taken into surgery. Four days later, his wife, Sarah, arrived in Brussels. I couldn't wait to get in there and put my arms around him and hug him and just hold him. Happy that he was alive, that he made it. On May 1st, Bellin was reunited with daughters Cecilia and Vanessa. You want to shield them from the reality. You know, you want your kids to stay innocent and be able to grow without the worries that sometimes we face. In these circumstances, it's very hard, you know, to keep that reality from them. Okay, not too much weight on that right leg. After six surgeries and three months in the hospital, Bellin returned to the United States on June 9th. Therapists at University Hospital at the University of Michigan are helping him learn to walk again. Okay. <laughs> Bellin says it was his daughters who gave him the will to survive. How are the girls doing? They're doing great. <laughs> yeah. They're so happy that he's back here. But it was hard for them, especially our youngest. She would cry for him every night. I'm not playing anything. I know what you're playing. They were my motivation. And to be able to overcome that, you need some motivation behind that. And um, <laughs> just, just thinking about that moment, it's, it, it's tough. Look at Mama. I owe a lot to them because it's your kids. You know, you don't want them to grow up without a dad. It's, um, I, without them knowing, I owe, I owe them a lot. I've had 13 surgeries, major surgeries, since March 22nd. I no longer feel anything in my left leg. From the knee down, it's numb. It's like having an arm that falls asleep, but yet it's my leg. I have metal all through me. It's been a difficult journey. It's a difficult journey because I went from being a professional basketball player who's dedicated his life to excel physically to being handicapped for life. Yes, I'm handicapped. It's not a dirty word. A handicap doesn't mean you can't do something. It just means it's a little more difficult. And it's in those challenges, it's in overcoming those difficulties that life has taught me some of those beautiful lessons. Every single day of my life, since March 22nd, I struggle with one thing. I struggle in being a survivor rather than a victim. There's a big difference between being a survivor and a victim. A survivor is someone who overcomes an experience, who becomes better, who becomes stronger, who learns from the experience at hand. A victim is somebody who becomes lesser, and it's a choice. Is it a fair choice to make? No, it's not. 
Is it a difficult one? Absolutely. But I am a survivor, and I'm very proud of being a survivor. But the journey is hard. The journey is long. It's an everyday battle. And there are certain things that help me along the way. So those are the things I'd like to share with you today. And one of the things that a survivor is really keen on creating is, listen, if I had to go through that mess, if I had to go through that experience, let's make it worthwhile. Let's give back something because I'm one of the lucky ones. I'm very lucky. I'm far luckier than the dead woman that was next to me a few seconds after the explosion, after I came up. She's a victim. I'm a survivor. And so what is it after these years that have passed that I want to give back, that I want to create maybe a first step for other survivors, for other people with handicaps. We, we all have our handicaps, whether they're small, big. We have handicaps. And I wanted to create a community of people, a community of new technologies. And these new technologies that often people have not heard of are technologies that can help a handicapped athlete overcome one of the main challenges that I've set myself. And what's that challenge? I'm going to run, or try to run, I should say, and finish an Ironman in 2020. So, it's not an easy thing to do. My wife told me the other day, she says, you know, what, 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 is this realistic? And I pretended I've lost 50% of hearing in my left ear, so I pretended not to hear her. <laughs> I said, well, you know what? <laughs> yes, it's a piece of cake. I got this. <laughs> and this community is coaches, is new technologies, is new methods, new unique approaches in how to achieve one of the hardest endurance races in the world. But how do you build this? How do you build this community? How do you build this this team, is there something that you can create, a manual that you can give to others so that they can also take that first step and overcome their challenges? Is there an equation? And I think there is. I believe there are four pillars that you can practically build anything on. The first pillar is team. Now, it may sound very cliche, Yes, it's team, we know. But it's a special type of team. It's a team with no ego. And that's very hard to do. My father always told me, he said, Seb, when I was growing up, I hear him now. Maybe I didn't hear him back then. But he said, Seb, if you're the smartest guy in the room, change rooms. You'll never be challenged if you're always the smartest guy in the room. Now, that doesn't happen to me very often. But I always make sure to create a team around me with people who can challenge me, with people who are different, with people who have different handicaps. A blind man can see. It's different than you and me, but he or she can see. Our ego will tell us, no, no, you got to be the best. You have to be the best. But is being the best, is surrounding yourself with people who maybe have other gifts, who are maybe are stronger than you, I think you create that challenge, that fire in you to achieve sometimes the unimaginable. So you create your team, the first pillar. What's the second pillar? The second pillar is this illusion of fear. I think we live in a society that lives with so much fear. Before anything has happened, a lot of us already think, oh my gosh, I'm going to fail. I'm going to ramble on for 15 minutes and they're not going to even know at this TED Talk. 
this fear absolutely paralyzes us. We may see our kids in the tree, happy, playing, and they're like, oh, my gosh, come down. You're going to fall from the tree. You're going to break your leg. Fear paralyzes us. Fear drains us of energy. And it's very hard to maximize a team when you have fear. Fear is an illusion. There is a big difference between danger and fear. Danger is a car coming at you full speed. That's dangerous. Move out of the way. Fear is waking up in the morning thinking, oh, no, I'm going to get hit by a car. The only place fear exists is in your mind. And we have control over fear. So if you rid yourself of these illusions, watch how much you maximize the team you created. So we've created our team. We've rid ourselves of these illusions. What's the third pillar? The third pillar is focus. It's a lot easier to focus when you have a clear mind, when your energy is not being drained by illusions. I can tell you that moments after the attack, I started noticing opportunities around me. When you don't have fear, opportunities start emerging. How many of us miss opportunities? And so I saw a scarf to my right. And the scarf became my tourniquet. I saw a little suitcase to my left. And somehow I managed to lift my legs above the suitcase to stop the flow of blood. I saw a passenger, a baggage cart in the distance. And all of a sudden, I had legs again. They moved me on to the, uh, to the baggage cart and they could wheel me around. Life had put everything I needed to beat death. Life had placed there before me. Every opportunity I needed was there. And I saw it. In that very moment, was I in danger of dying? Yes. Was I dead? No. I was a survivor. Fear had no place in me. I challenge you today to rid yourselves of these illusions and watch your focus become clear. So we've created our team. We have rid ourselves of illusions. And now we have a clear focus. So what are we going to focus on? Well, it's my fourth pillar. My fourth pillar is quantity versus quality. Oh, my goodness. We live in a world where quantity is what matters. We're judged by quantity. Oh, that's your big house? Wow. You're a good guy, huh? You got three cars? Hmm. Wow. Good for you, man. Good job. Oh, that's your, you're going to your second house in in, uh, in Spain? Oh, wow, good. We have a become obsessed, a society obsessed with judging, with focusing on quantity. And quantity to me is a want. Now, do I struggle with this? Of course, because it's very easy to focus on quantity. It's natural. The more you have, the more you feel good. It's human nature. But to focus on quality is much harder. And I'll challenge you by asking you to close your eyes right now. Close your eyes. I'm not going to scare you. <laughs> close your eyes and think of something that you truly want. Can you put a number beside that? Can you quantify it? My theory is, and what I've rebuilt myself on, is that if you can quantify it, it's a want. It's not a need. And there's a big difference between your wants and your needs. What you truly need, it's not possible to quantify. It's that simple. If you can quantify it, I will argue that it's a want. 
And I see people who are zooming through life who tend to put a focus on quality. It's not an easy thing to do. It's not an easy thing to do to teach a teammate, listen, don't worry too much about your stats. Worry about being the best teammate. Worrying about making your other teammates better people. It's a very hard thing to do. But it's the foundation of success. The focus on quality versus the focus on quantity. And I'll, I'll leave you with this final image. It's an image I use with my daughters all the time. You know, we all go to work. We all go to the gym. We all, we all have days in, a, in, 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 our, in our lives where we have luggage. We travel. And every day before my daughters leave to school, I ask them, I said, hey, what are you putting in your bag? And they roll their eyes because they've heard the story. But I said, listen, make sure you're putting quality into that bag. Because I see people stuffing so much quantity in their bags. You see them. You see them in life, people dragging their feet, heavy, like life is weighing them down. And then you see the people just zooming through life. How much does love weigh? How much does tolerance weigh? How much does open-mindedness weigh? It weighs nothing. In fact, the more you put quality into your bags, the lighter you be. So if I leave you, if I've rambled on for 15 minutes, 18 minutes, if there's one thing I challenge you to do, every morning when you leave for work, every morning when you leave on a trip, I challenge you to see, to check yourself, how much quality are you putting in your luggage? Because ladies and gentlemen, I can tell you that the difference in my life between life and death is not the quantity that I have, but the quality of my life. Thank you.